So, Iki, I should say good evening. <laughs> yes. Would that be correct? Yes, you're right. And good morning to you. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I am super excited. I told you off air that I just sort of crossed my fingers, said a little prayer. I went, I'm going to send a message, see yeah. what happens. I, I didn't expect a response, but you responded immediately. And I didn't know what to do. I was like, well, this is unusual. You know, I've, I've had a lot of no's. As you know, uh, but you were one of the ones that said yes, and so I'm so so grateful to be chatting with you. So appreciate your time and appreciate you saying yes. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Iki, just share with us just quickly uh, your role currently in chaplaincy because uh, there's so much I want to unpack with you uh, in our in our talk about ministry, about chaplaincy, and about other sports other than uh, uh, basketball. So yeah, yeah. So currently, I'm one of the chaplains for the Houston Rockets in the NBA. And I'm entering in, I think this season will be my seventh season, I think, with the team. So, yeah. Wow, seven season. What does, what does year seven look like from year one? <laughs> well, I would say year number six or five and a half and six were kind of turned upside down because of uh, COVID-19 yeah. and all that. We haven't had any chapels for the last basically year, year and a half or so. So that's been a challenge. So this is my seventh season coming up, but it really feels like season number maybe five and a half or six, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I've gotten to know a lot of players in the league now, both uh, players on the Rockets and then players on other teams as well. So uh, I think I'm one of the few Asian chaplains okay. as well. So I'm pretty kind of well known for being that guy. A lot of people think I'm related to Jeremy Lin or something, but um, <laughs> you just um, say yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I've got to know players again uh, on the Rockets and on other teams. So when they come to chapel, uh, there's already that relationship that's built from years past. Yeah, and that's really interesting you said that. Obviously, other players know you from other teams as well. Um, does every team in the NBA have chaplains, or is uh, are you one of very few that have that is a chaplain? No, every team in the NBA has a chaplain. Everyone oh, does. wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do you guys do a collective? Because I've I, I done a bit of homework, and I saw that you and uh, yourself and one other um, chaplain, I think it's the NFL, have created a podcast mm -hmm. where you get other chaplains to do devotionals. Is that how it works? Every time you sort of go to a game or go to a city, you're like, hey, let's connect. Let's do something together. Uh, there's actually a couple things that we do. So there is like a uh, network of NBA chaplains. We all keep in touch with each other via email um, or text message as well. And then also two years ago, yeah, two years ago, we all met together in Charlotte, North Carolina for the NBA All-Star Game. So the NBA had us come together. They did some training for us. Uh, we were in a hotel with a lot of uh, former NBA players, which was pretty cool. Got to see a lot of people uh, I watched growing up. Um, so, yeah, we networked and connected, and our wives were there as well, and they connected. Uh, and then every year in September, like late September, there's a ministry called RBC Radio Bible Class, and they host kind of a chaplain's gathering as well. Yeah. So how did you get into uh, chaplaincy work? Like, it's not just something you just go, yep, I'm going to be a, a chaplain for an NBA team. Like, I'm really curious. And I had a lot of people ask me as I was preparing for this, they're like, how do you how do you become a chaplain in a team like that or just in the NBA? Yeah. Well, you know, um, I grew up in a non-Christian home. Uh, my parents were Japanese immigrants in California. And we were, I would say, Shinto Buddhist, uh, but we came to America and we celebrated Christmas and Easter. And I had no idea why other than Christmas presents and Easter bunnies and all that. Uh, in high school, though, or actually in junior high, I started getting really active in sports. I did wrestling. Uh, what else did I do? Track and field or athletics. Um, and then in high school, a friend of mine asked me to play rugby. And wow. I didn't know that, uh, that uh, the coach was a youth pastor and about a third of the team were guys from his youth ministry. So at the end of our rugby season, uh, our scrum half took me out to lunch and he shared the gospel with me about how Christ loved me. He actually, he actually asked me, do you celebrate Christmas and Easter? And I said, I do. He said, do you know why? And I said, I have no idea why other than presents and gifts and all that and Easter bunnies and all that. So uh, anyway, he shared the gospel with me and I took this little track home with me and I read it again and explained the plan of salvation that God had. And uh, and this is going to sound crazy, but I at the time was a typical California kid. So I had dreadlocks. I was like okay. always wearing surf shorts and uh, T-shirts and tank tops and hoodies and flip flops and riding my bike everywhere. Um, and I remember hearing somewhere in the Bible, you're supposed to pray in your closet. So I remember taking this little track, going to my closet, turning the light on and then praying this prayer and trusting Jesus wow. Christ. 
as my savior. So from day one, uh, I've always thought sports and Jesus yeah. go together. That's that's what I just assumed because that's how yeah. God saved me through rugby. So uh, when I got to seminary school, I was in grad school trained to be a pastor after God had called me to ministry. And a good friend of ours asked me to do what's called a huddle here in America for okay. the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And so uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes is a ministry here in the U.S. Actually, it's international now. But anyway, so I was at a school at 630 in the morning, a junior high or middle school. So sixth, seventh and eighth graders. And I know they didn't want to be there. It was really early in the morning for them. Right. And I did a little Bible lesson. And that's how it really got kicked off. My pastor spiritual father, or Dr. Tony Evans. He is or was a chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys in the NFL. Okay. And he was a chaplain for the Dallas Mavericks in the NBA. And so I just got a taste of it even with him as well. So did that. Uh, and then I just spoke at a lot of FCA events, Fellowship Christian Athlete events, huddles yep. and various things. And about 10 years ago, a college uh, was starting their football team. And my wife and I were college pastors and ministers and they asked me to be the chaplain for the football team. And so that's okay. how I started in like more of a formal role as a team chaplain. And I uh, did that for about a decade. And then that door closed when they let that coach go. And even yes. though I was a volunteer, uh, the new coach didn't have a chaplaincy at all or a chapel. Okay. Uh, and then a week later, the head chaplain for the Rockets, uh, he and I were grabbing lunch. And he said, hey, I've been praying about adding to our team. And I've been praying for the last two years. And every time I've prayed, your name keeps coming up. And he said, would wow. you consider um, joining our team? And so, again, six, seven years ago, uh, yeah. yes, and uh, been doing it now for, I guess, seven years or seven seasons. Yeah. So you were friends with the with the, with the rock. You said the owner or the manager before? The before. chaplain. So there's there's chaplain, uh, sorry. Yeah. five of us who are chaplains. Oh, wow. Five of you. Okay. Yes. That's a surprise. I thought it was just you, just one man band. No. Wow. Well, we, have, we have 41 home games plus playoffs. And so, I mean, okay. it's one hour before tip off. So again, imagine being a husband and a yes. father and a pastor or minister and just a lot of other responsibilities. And it's a volunteer position. So uh, it takes a quite a bit of time uh, commitment. So it's kind of hard to ask one person, even two people to commit to having, you know, 40, 50, 60 nights uh, during the year out. So, yeah. Is it, is it is it normal uh, to have a lot of people of faith in the sports um, industry, like obviously in basketball? Because here in, in Australia, the context is quite different. It's very uh, secular. So, so the only time you really know if someone's a Christian, especially the athletes, if, for example, here in rugby, it's a common thing where after they play players on opposite teams, they'll just be on the field, just near down and pray. Then people are like, oh, they're Christians. But it's not something that's spoken out loud. Um, another example is that, and I'll, I'll throw it back to you, was um, at the Olympics, we had a young female high jumper who was just like all sold out for Christ. It was amazing. And she won our first ever medal. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's just in the whole nation was celebrating her. And they're, they're wondering, why is she so happy? So she would often, after she would jump, she would go back to her diary and she'll, and she'll write, it, write some stuff. She'll journal. Yeah. And then later on, we found out um, that she was a, a, a devout Christian. And so a lot of the interviews that happened after that, she was interviewed, I think, immediately straight after she, she had won. And she's there just literally sharing. Those. She's like, this is all for Jesus, or glory to God. And I was shocked. My jaw dropped because I guess in our context, it's not it's not a common thing to to have a faith and go hey because of i guess this the society that we are here in australia i think that yeah, there's a lot of people of faith in one your organization but two just in the nba yeah you know so again being a, a lover of rugby i mean i remember in uh probably the late 80s early 90s if you remember yeah. the samoan player timo tagaloa i mean he was oh, a very yes. believer as yes. well, and even this year in the Olympics, when Fiji won the sevens gold medal, I mean they're worshiping and praising the Lord right there in the middle of the pitch and right. praying yeah, and God yeah. the Lord and singing. And then I saw a documentary of them as well. I mean it's part yes. of the fabric of their team, you know. So yes. um, you know there there are believers out there um, for sure internationally. Um, I think the challenge in America is in certain parts of the U.S. There's what we call cultural Christianity that you know you go okay. to church on Sundays and you're a good person and um, and there may not be a relationship. It's just part of the culture of kind of how you were brought up. Right. So for some of us, there, there are some players right. who come and it's much more cultural because their grandma 
you know, used to take them to church and they just think, okay, I need to go to a religious service before a basketball game to try to get my head right or get, you know, get my mind right. Um, and so really differentiating between having a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, you know, being a follower of Jesus versus just being a very religious person trying to quote, you know, be good, I guess. Uh, is a yeah. 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 Is your role as a chaplain or chaplains in your team um, intentional? Like obviously the organization like we love the chaplains here in Australia. We're more so almost considered like a well-being person, like you're part of the well-being team, like yeah. mental health or mindset. You're sort of part of that cluster. But and then there's chaplaincy. But for, for you, it sounds like you have permission as a team to be um, not ashamed of going what you do. Is, is is that how it works there? Like you can just go up to anyone and start talking openly about it because they know, oh, yeah, that's just chaplain Icky or whoever. It depends. So okay. uh, it depends on the management. Uh, so there are some NBA teams that give, a, I would say, like free reign to the chaplains. I mean, they can go anywhere, talk to anybody. Uh, some NBA teams even give the chaplains tickets and parking passes. So you can park where the players park and you have tickets to the game. Uh, I remember many years ago, uh, my last kind of month in Dallas, Dr. Evans gave me tickets to the game. And so I went to go see the Mavericks play the Spurs and we were right behind the court courtside area. And uh, but for us as Rockets, we are volunteers. Um, they give us free access. We have these access passes, which allow us to go anywhere in the Toyota Center, the locker room, the dining room. And for us, it's not just a ministry to players and coaches, but also the personnel there as well. So we do a lot of yeah. ministry to like the security guards and to the other staff where they're supporting the players and coaches. Uh, I've had trainers and I've had the scorekeeper and others we built relationships with and uh, had a chance to minister to them. Um, so, yeah, it depends on the team. As we when we gathered for that gathering in Charlotte, North Carolina, I mean, there's some people who literally they're told by the team, you come in, do chapel. And after you're done, leave. Like there's no other right. thing to do. Yep. And other teams see it as, again, mental health, well-being. Hey, if we know if you can get our players in a good place spiritually and mentally, then they're going to be better athletes on the floor and we're going to win more games, you know, so. Yeah. In sporting teams and, and just the business side of things, players are very transit depending on what contract they're on, injury. So you're constantly seeing players come and go. What's your approach for players who come into the organization how do you approach them going, okay, this this person has been in the league for maybe five plus years, so they're not a rookie. So they sort of understand. What's what's your personal approach to meeting and trying to connect with these uh, new players that come onto the team? Yeah, so, you know, most of these players, whether they're famous players or role players, you know, they don't trust people because yeah. for many of them, they have fame and they have wealth and they have a lot of people vying for those things. Right. So chaplain, if you can build trust with them because they don't trust a whole lot of people, uh, then usually we'll exchange phone numbers. And the chapel time, the 15 minutes we have before the game starts, uh, or one hour before the game starts, the 15 minute kind of chapel time is more of a springboard to building a relationship so that between practices, between games, you can text them, meet them for lunch. And then they have other questions about, you know, whether it's relationships or about, career and calling and those kinds of things. So that's what we use. Or I personally do with chapel is use it yeah. as an opportunity to have regular connection time, but they use it as a springboard to have some time outside of the chapel and even outside of the season. I mean, there's a player in the NBA now that I text him pretty regularly, yeah. um, even though we're in the off season currently. Yeah. What surprised you in the seven years as, as a chaplain? Has there been anything in your role as a chaplain or in your chaplaincy journey that has surprised you? Um, yeah, um, I won't name teams, but no, no. I've, I've seen this, uh, that the teams that have a lot of players, because Chapel is voluntary. Yeah. Oh, okay, strange, right. It's right. strange right. because Chapel is, so when I did college football or gridiron, when I did college yes. football Chapel, uh, it's only the home team or the away team. And so it's more of a kind of another speech to help get people excited about the game. It's like, it's like a pep talk. Like, yeah, like hey, talk. guys, let's sure. get. <laughs> you know, win for Jesus kind of thing. Yeah. In my first chapel, my first year in the NBA, you have both the away team and the home team, coaches, players, strength coaches, everybody together. And I'm, I'm baffled because I said, in one hour, y'all are about to go out on the court, bump elbows and fight and try to win the game. And yet for this 15 minutes, you are brothers in Christ and you are willing to take those differences aside and unite together. Uh, so one thing I found, generally speaking, 
because Chapel is voluntary and because it's both home and away team, I found that the teams that have a lot of players attend Chapel because part of the message of, I think of Jesus is dying to yourself and being selfless Right. is they, they have really good teams. They have really good team chemistry because I think for a lot of the teams that have players who come to Chapel on a regular basis, whether they're, you know, religious or really, you know, committed believers of uh, followers of Jesus, they have that uh, team first attitude, that selflessness. Um, yeah. Um, that humility as well, I believe. So I've seen that yeah. generally speaking in the NBA. Yeah. How has your approach then in chaplaincy or connecting with people changed in the seven years? Obviously you come in year one, you've had a bit of experience with chaplaincy in a football team, but then it's like, okay, how have you, how have you seen your growth from year one to year seven? Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, back when I was doing college football chapel, I, I didn't really get into the pep talk side. I, I was just would give a biblical message. Um, but now that I've got both the home and the away team together, the message is a lot less about like, and, and I, it never really was like God be on our side. It's much more of an issue using a character, right. handling wins and losses, handling the pressures of the game, representing Jesus, you know, playing basketball as an act of worship being a living sacrifice, those kinds of things. Um, and also too, you know, uh, like I mentioned earlier in the interview, um, relationships, you know, when I was my first year there, I was this unknown guy. And like I said, I think I was the only, and still am the only Asian Japanese American chaplain in the NBA. But now, like, as I've done it more and more, you know, I've gotten to know players that when I see them courtside or I see them in chapel, like there's already that connection. So I don't need to spend the first two or three minutes of the chapel time building trust because they know, hey, I, I can trust this guy. This guy's going to tell us uh, truth from God's word. Yeah. What does this, um, I was just thinking, what does success look like for you in terms of your role? Um, just because, again, chapel's voluntary, players are coming in and out of teams all the time. How do you measure that? I know you, you can have feedback forms. That's good. But for, like for you personally, how do you know that you're I guess here, I don't know if it's the same saying now, how do you know that you're kicking the goals? Like, how do you know that you're doing, you're on the right sort of direction? Yeah. Um, one is, I like this verse right behind me. I can't see right here. Over oh, my other side. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go make disciples of all ethnicities, you know, so of all nations, right. all the nations. So, you know, if, if God allows me to disciple some of these players, uh, which is beginning to happen, I think that's a mark of success. Uh, the second one, probably like every pastor, every preacher would say, is uh, application or obedience to God's word. So that when you and I would teach or preach and then we see believers put the message into practice. Uh, so here's a, a cool thing that happened my mom, second or third year. I don't remember which year it was. But I did a message on using your platform. Had God has given all of us a platform for some of us, it's higher and larger than others. And I said, but God is going to hold you accountable for that. Like he's going to judge you one day for the platform he gives you. And so I said, use your platform for, you know, to, to tell people about Jesus, to, to share the love of Jesus Christ. Well, then about a month later, I didn't know this at the time, but there was a, a sports writer who was doing a story on the Houston Rockets and the chaplaincy. And so he's talking about two or three of the major uh, tenders of chapel participants uh, and so then he interviews one of those guys and the guy almost line for line, word for word. One of the players says, hey, I know God has given me this platform, you know, and I want to be, you know, use it to tell people about him. And that's why I'm here. Like, I know God's given me this platform. And so it's this really interesting story, again, of just of this uh, journalist who interviews yeah. these three players. And I just in this one player's uh, words, I heard the very same message I'd given again a week or two before that he repeats to this uh, journalist. And here's the crazy thing. Then I reach out to the journalist and I say, hey, journalist, and I found him, I think on Twitter or social media somewhere, and we connected. And so now he and this journalist and I are now engaging in conversation based on this article he wrote about the chaplaincy for the Rockets. Um, yeah, that, that he was curious about and wanted to know more about. Man, on your team of, how, how many chaplains did you say that there was on your team? me five, five total. So five. So that's five different. Is it five different perspectives of Christianity? Like you come from different faiths or, or churches. Like how does your team synergy work? Like because I'm really interested because yeah. you all have a, a same goal and mission, I would assume. Yeah. But then in terms of your 
interpretation or the way you practice it and they go, hey, do you have a vision board? And do you go, okay, you do that and I do this or just yeah. go, whenever you have your 15 minutes, do whatever you need to do. How does it all work? I'll tell you what, uh, Houston is the most diverse city in America. It has now surpassed New York as the most diverse city in America. Wow. And our chaplain team, so our head chaplain is African-American. He's black. Our uh, Another chaplain is, I believe, the ch child of Syrian immigrants. So he's Middle Eastern. Wow. And then another one is from Colombia, from immigrants from Colombia, uh, which is in South America. And then another one is half black, half white. His mom is white. His dad is African-American. And then there's me. So our team... So it's diverse. probably the most culturally, ethnically diverse chapel team or chaplains team in the NBA, but it represents the city of Houston. You know, that's that's who we represent. Okay. And so uh, we meet every month uh, because of uh, COVID stuff and all that. We haven't been meeting in person. We've been doing Zoom meetings and other online type meetings. But generally during the season, we meet for an hour, uh, hour and a half or so every mm -hmm. month. And we pray together and we compare notes and we encourage each other and uh, we are we're brothers in Christ. It's that Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Uh, and then, yeah, I, we come from different, I would say, denominational backgrounds. Sure. But generally on the majors, we all agree on. And we're all about making disciples and preaching God's word and loving, loving our neighbor and loving God. So, yeah, we're very united in those things. Are many other teams similar to you in terms of you have a team of five or is most teams have a group of chaplains? We get heckled all the time by the other mm -hmm. other teams because we've got five <laughs> of us. I think the closest one next to us has four chaplains. Um, okay. It's the Spurs. And I know all the Spurs chaplains, San Antonio Spurs chaplains. I believe there's four of them now. So, um, yeah. yeah. Should be the San Antonio Australians. There's something about the Spurs and Australians. You know what I mean? Like we're constantly, yeah. constantly recruiting Australians. Yeah. Um, speaking about platforms yourself, other than the work that you do in in uh, in the organization for for the Rockets, you're also involved. In, um, what what yeah? What role do you play outside of uh, the organization? Yeah. So I'm uh, the lead pastor for Bay City Fellowship at Spring Branch which is a church here in Houston that has multiple campuses. We have three campuses, oh, wow. uh, one in Tomball, one in Cyprus, and one here in Houston. And the area of Houston is known as Spring Branch. So we're the probably the most urban campus, I guess, of all the three. Uh, and I've been here a little over a year now. And before that, I was at a church here in Houston as well for about a decade and probably the most ethnically, culturally diverse church in Houston. Uh, yeah. That's did, that, did, did, did that happen by accident? Um Icky, or was that something intentional about the way you wanted to do ministry? You wanted it to be multicultural, um, obviously intergenerational, like every church. But was that was that part of something that you wanted, or did God show you that and go, "Hey, this is where you're going to go because it's going to help you later on"? Well, part of it, again going back to rugby. I know we're probably speaking the yeah. same language. The rugby team I played for. Our coach was a youth pastor, about a third of the team were some of the students from his youth ministry. On our team, we had two Samoan brothers. Yeah. We had uh, an, uh, two or three African-American players, Hispanic, Asian, white. I mean, it was a very, very diverse team. And the first Sunday I visited the church, and the church was like maybe a block or two, you know, very, very close, probably less than a kilometer away from our high school. And our school is very, very diverse ethnically and culturally, even socioeconomically. Yeah. And the church was all white. It was all white, about a thousand members, except we had two Asian families and one black family. And I was baffled. I said, how is it the rugby team I play for is so diverse? How is it our neighborhood is diverse, our school is so diverse? And yet this church, which is in our neighborhood, is it lacks diversity. Um, and so yeah. I remember just kind of having my heart broken a little bit. And then I got to college. Uh, we ran track and I played rugby and ran track in college and had a roommate who's African-American who's black. And then two roommates who were white. We studied together. We laughed together. We did life together. We're all brothers in Christ. But on Sunday mornings, we all went to different churches. So, again, that bothered me as well, is that we can live together and uh, work out together and practice together and study together and, you know, talk about girls and who likes who together. But yet Sunday mornings or when we, you know, time for worship, we went to different places. So. Yeah, that's kind of what sparked it. Um, and then again, my athletic background that, you know, this, I mean, uh, yeah. whether it's Patty Mills or Ben yeah. Simmons or, you know, LeBron James, they don't care what your background is culturally or ethnically. They want to know, can you play? <laughs> and are you willing to, 
you know, play for us and, and, and unite with other people to, to achieve a, a greater goal, you know, so. Yeah, I, I, I really love what you said about um, uh, that background, because I think a lot of our upbringing really serves um, what we do in life or later on in life. I was really interested, Iki, um, to, to ask, have you had any of your organization or people in your organization from the top to the players come and visit any of your church? And they're like, hey, Chaplain Iki, where, where's your church? Let me come drop in one time. Have you, have you been surprised? If, uh, yeah, I'm really interested to know. Um, so uh, to answer your question very briefly, no. They have, several players have asked me where the church is, okay. but none of them have come. I think the challenge for a lot of players, so the church I pastor is quite large. Yeah. Um, and so I think the hard thing for them is to worship anonymously. Like they just want to come yeah. and worship, listen to yeah. the word. They have family, they just want to bring their kids and not be, yeah. hey, take a selfie with me for Instagram. Oh, no. yeah. yeah. Sign an autograph type of thing. And that's what chapel is. Chapel for many of them is their, is their worship church. gathering, right? right? Is their church. Um, but, um, so when I pastored, uh, a little bit south of where I am today, um, the Houston Texans, which is our NFL team. Yes. So the difference between NBA and NFL is this, uh, the NBA, you know, it's normally the guys are very tall. You know what they look like cause you see them on TV, but in the NFL for a lot of the players, they wear a helmet. So you really don't know what they look like other than some of the superstars. So true. So yeah. true. So we had several NFL players at the church I pastored, uh, and they played typically on Sundays. But in the off season, they would come to our church, and they'd worship, and they would fit right in because for most of them, they looked just like regular guys, maybe a little bit more athletic or larger, but they weren't six eight, know. six nine, and you know, really tall. Matter of fact, uh, it was like a decade ago, nine years ago, our assistant worship leader was a huge Houston Texans fan, huge okay. Texans fan, and he said, "Hey, was that one player here this morning?" I said, "Yeah, he was here." And he said, where was he sitting? And I said, in the back, in the center. What was he wearing? I said, he was wearing a red shirt and some jeans. This is what he told me. I was sitting right next to him, and I didn't even know it was him. <laughs> but, if, but if Ben Simmons came to your church or LeBron James came to your church, you would know who they are because, again, they're, they're yeah. stature, but also you see them on TV all the time. So, Yeah. What's your relationship like with um, um, the admin of the organization? Like, obviously, you're the chaplaincy team. But you have to build your own bridge to to like towards the admin, and you know, obviously, yeah. I, I, again, because I'm just coming from, I have no idea. It's kind of cool that we, there's a chaplain in the NBA, but how do you talk to the CEO or the manager or the own? Like, do you get moments like that where you just like, oh, hello, and then a conversation sparks, or is it just hi, bye, and you keep moving? No, we do, we do. So okay. actually, the, the head of security, who's over security for the entire. Toyota Center and all that. I wouldn't say we're friends, but I talk to him pretty regularly and check in with him and I ask him, hey, how can I be praying for you? Is there anything that you have a need for? Um, so I check in with him pretty regularly. Uh, and then his team of security guards as well, I check in with them. Uh, matter of fact, uh, so no Rockets players or coaches have come, even though they've asked about where the church is. Okay. But we did have some people in the ticket office come recently. So um, I was able to connect with, he's a friend of a friend. And they said, hey, if you're moving here to Houston and looking for a church, go check out the church that Icky pastors. And so they came uh, in all their rockets, paraphernalia and gear and all that. So, uh, yeah, we've connected with some of the ticket office and front office people as well, which has been pretty cool. So it's not just, again, a ministry to coaches and players, but also to the people who work behind the scenes as well. Yeah. Yeah. During COVID year, obviously, that shook the world. Um, how were you? Um, able to pivot as a team and also as an as a chaplain yourself to still provide that service for the players because obviously they're in isol everyone was isolated. Um, what did you guys do? And yeah, how did how did you help also yourself through um, you know a world crisis? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's the the good thing about technology, I guess, with either cell phones or even uh, computers and Zoom and internet. So that's how we connect with our players. But it was still very, very challenging. I'll just, I'll be very frank with y'all. It was really, really challenging. So our head chaplain knows some of the players in the Rockets. I know some players. And so we were all just kind of texting and connecting with various players and checking on them during the season. Um, but there was no formal Bible study or formal chapel time that we were doing. And I would say every chaplain I talked to in the NBA, 
was really struggling with that as well. Like, how do we connect with our players when we can't see them face to face on a regular basis like we used to? And so for many of them, it was texting and calls and things like that. Does your role as a chaplain encompass connecting with the players' families or is it only specifically, hey, stay within the boundaries of the organization, workers who work in front office and all the way down to the, those who do the strapping and the water bottles and the players, yeah. is there opportunity to do stuff with families? Obviously, if they're on a road and, you know, there's so, how many games, you say 40-something, I don't know. 82, sure games. Games. 82 yeah. games. Yeah, mm-hmm. 82 games. Like, And obviously the families are missing their 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 players, their, their fathers, their partners. Yeah. Do you, are you allowed to connect with families or have you done it? And what sort of things do you do to sort of support them? Uh, you know, we've actually talked about that. So some of the NBA teams do that. That So we have okay. access to what's known as a family room. So at the home games, the, the wives or girlfriends and the kids are allowed to come to the game and they go to the family room. Uh, for me, I think it'd probably be my wife who would do something like that. So my wife yeah. also is a uh, former college athlete, really involved in sports ministry as well. She was actually asked to be the chaplain for a WNBA team many, many years ago. Wow. Uh, but at the time we had two young kids, and so she was unable to do it. So we've talked about it, um, uh, but nothing right now of, of really engaging the girlfriends and the wives and even the kids as well to, to minister to them. Yeah. Icky, what brings you the most joy about your role? Um, the most joy is these are men who trust very few people because of their wealth and their fame and notoriety. And when God opens a door where they begin to now trust you, that they can share confidential things with you, struggles that they have, you know, the stuff that the media doesn't see, the people, the fans don't see. And you enter into that discipleship relationship and can address those issues from the Bible, from scripture and apply it to their lives. Uh, For me, that's what brings me the most joy. I, I love chapel time with the 10 minutes of teaching and praying with the guys but really, it's after chapel when, you know, one or two of the players or coaches will hang out afterwards and say, hey, hey, do you have a minute just to chat a little bit about some things I need to, some answers and help with? Um, that's what really brings me joy, that God opens that door for us. Yeah. Iki, I have two more questions and then we're done for our chat. Uh, the first question is, what position did you play in rugby? Uh, <laughs> as, I, as I got older, I went closer and closer to the pack. So I started winger uh, yeah. when I was young. And fast, and then I've also played outside center and played inside center. Uh, in sevens, I've played everything. I've played prop, of course, from half, and I mean everything. You name, I've played in sevens. So yeah. And sometimes we would even ref as well in sevens because we'd be like, "No, you didn't see that ref. I saw it. That was a forward." <laughs> yeah. Um, Icky, my last question is: Is there something that you wish? Um, is there a question that you wish that I had asked you? Question that you wish. Yeah. Um, uh, most of the time people ask me, like, what do you do in chapel? Like when in that 15 minutes, you know, so we have it one hour before yeah. tip off. So if we get tip offs at 705, at yeah. 605, we gather in the chapel room. And most people say, what happens in that, you know, that special room and all these players and stars and coaches come together? Like what happens? And so that's, that's probably the question. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's so cool. Well, Iki, thank you so much for your time. I've been super inspired in this in the short amount of time if people want to find you on social media just to just to connect and just check you out or even if they happen to be visiting houston uh tell us where you are based in terms of your church and uh who knows you may get a bunch of australians and you and kiwis going yeah. we watched this and we said we had to come to this church so tell us uh those details uh, and I would welcome Kiwis and Wallabies. And hey. <laughs> uh, I wore my All Blacks jersey. I have a Richie McCall All Blacks jersey I wear every now and then. And we have some uh, some Springboks, some South Africans here at the church. And they they were offended by that, that I wore the, uh, the their All Blacks jersey on a, on a Sunday morning. So, um, yeah, we're at bayoucityfellowship.com. So Bayou is B-A-Y-O-U, city is city, fellowship.com. And we have three locations and we have worship gatherings on Sundays at 9 and 11. Uh, we also yeah. have a streaming on YouTube and a podcast as well. So if people want to hear some messages and sermons that I've preached, those are available there. And then on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, I'm at Icky Soma, all one word, I-K-K-I-S-O-M-A. And I'm on Facebook as well. I think I'm there's only two Icky Somas on Facebook and one is in the Japanese Air Force and the other one lives in Houston, Texas. So if you want to connect me there, they can connect me on Facebook as well. Yeah, nice, nice. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mickey. I know it's 
not getting late, but it is an evening for you. But uh, appreciate this episode. Appreciate your time. And hey, look, I, I hope one day if we're ever allowed to travel, I'd love to come and connect with you there. Uh, I'll bring I'll bring a football over as well, meaning a rugby ball yeah. uh, just from this end. I'll, tr- I'll see if I can find some chaplains who are uh, uh, chaplains in some of these rugby teams to sign it for you. And, and that's Great. a challenge. That's as a challenge. Yeah. But uh, thank you again, my brother. Great.